اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم <coughs> الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاۃ والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم محمد و علیہ طیبین الطاہرین و اصحاب المنتجبین و من طب احم بے احسان قیام یوم الدین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح علی صدری و یسر علی عمری واحل القدت من لسان یفقہ قولی اما بعد السلام علیکم جمیعا و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اسعد اللہ یامنا و یامکم بحاد المیلاد السعید بحاد المیلاد السعید I was thinking of uh, talking about my own personal experiences of life and how I have come through life with or in relation to Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi I was born in a family that belonged predominantly to the Ismaili persuasion. And it was a, an odd setup because as my cousin uncle is sitting there, his father was an Ithnashri. And we were one family. My great uncle was an Ithnashri, but my grand, uh, grandfather was an Ismaili and a Mukhi or the Kamari of the Ismaili Jamaat. So we would attend the Ismaili Jamaat Khana and yet we would go to the mosque that was next door and the Maulana would practically be living at our house. We would go to the mosque to pray Salah and observe our Iftari with the mosque and of course, more than anything, commemorate the month of Muharram at the mosque. It was a very mixed sort of a family and we had a so the neighbors were all Hindu. We would pray the Juma prayers and especially the Eid prayers at the Sunni mosque across the road. Now, I was very, very young, but I remember all of these. And of course, you have business associates and partners and people buying from you who are white and Christians and sometimes Jewish. So that was the context in which I was growing up. And I remember the fuqara or the Sufi fuqara that were in town, whenever they would come, they would come to visit my great aunt and they would sit at her feet. She was a very prominent and a spiritual figure in the family. So on an occasion, and I was seven at this point, and this is what I can recall, the Aga Khan had come. And of course, the family was enthusiastic to go and do Didar of the Aga Khan the ziyara of the Aga Khan. And I asked my great aunt who had been raising me. So I've been very fortunate to have several very spiritual women raise me, my mother, my great aunt, and I couldn't distinguish who my real mother was from the three or four women who were raising me. So I asked her on an occasion, and I was seven, and I remember the darkness uh, outside the room where I was sitting and asking her, and I said, who is Aga Khan and how many Imams are there and who are Imams? So she said, I'm going to tell you something that you will remember till the end of your life. And she was right. She said, you have a prophet and he is Muhammad. Then there's an Imam and he is Ali. Then there is an Imam who is Hassan. And then there is an Imam who is Hussein. And then you're going to remember Imam Mahdi and forget about the rest. That's the time from when I remember Imam Hussein. And Imam Hussein became a part of my life. You see, my great aunt was an Ismaili by faith, outward faith, an Isnashri in her soul. Because she had left the Ismaili faith a long time ago, but she just did not have the courage to disrupt the balance of the family because she was such a prominent figure within the family. Now I remember after that, at those, in those tender years, we would go to the mosque and whenever the mention of Hussein would come, 
the eyes would tear and the heart would break, even at that age. And the only two people I can remember from the whole of my childhood that have had an impact on me and that I have been very intimately related to was Hazrat Abbas and Imam Hussein. Because in our family, Hazrat Abbas, I think, even had a more prominent position than Imam Hussein. Because every time there would be some problem, we would just chant the name of Hazrat Abbas. So that's how I was when in Uganda. Then when we came here, my great aunt, whom I was living with, would always read the majlis from her book at home. So every year, Imam Hussein would come to life and we would journey with him. And then it would be very sad that he would die. Of course, I didn't realize that Imam Hussein wasn't coming to life every year and dying every year. It's a story that's being told, but you're very young at that point and you can't really reason. And of course, people like me who become Molanas later on are very slow when they're kids, right? You didn't get that, right? Salwat. In any case, eventually I realized that this is a story that is being narrated every year. Then started going to the mosque and would listen to the talks. They were all in Urdu and thank God for Hindi movies that allowed us to acquaint ourselves with Urdu and therefore we could understand the majlises. Otherwise, there was no way we would have, we would have understood the Urdu. But this is, and you know now, the Molana is subliminally giving out messages by this point of, in any case. So would hear the content and would really cry for Imam Hussein and, and would do matam. And hey, that's it, that's the lifeline. I wasn't bothered about praying or f reading Quran or anything. They were just alien things. It was just Imam Hussein. There came a time in my teens, very early teens, that I'd lost interest in madlises as well. But I would make sure that I would go to the Ram Bayan, the Messiah of Imam Hussein, and for Ashura. That would be the only thing that would interest me. None of the one-hour prelude to the Messiah or the talk. That is how I grew up. Then, after being involved with Imam Hussein, I found that, no, who was the God that actually Imam Hussein worshipped? Through that inquiry in my, at the age of 16, I started reading the Quran and started doing sajida. I was a very unruly teenager, and, and, and of course those who know me, they knew, they know how I was. But through Imam Hussein, found the Quran and started practicing only one sajda at night and no more. That gradually acquainted me with the Quran, with the Blessed Prophet, with Imam Ali, and with the rest of religion. As I got into religion, and it was my great aunt's wish that I should go into religious education, and being impressionable, coming from a very spiritual side of religion and Islam, went into a very strict sense of black and white religion. And after studying it and studying it and studying it, I remember I would study 14 to 16 hours a day. And it wouldn't pose a problem, all these studies to me. But I remember there came a time when I said, I looked towards the sky, I came out once of my library after studying the halakat of Bakr al-Sadr, Ridwanullah Ali, and I said, this is totally against the religion that I have grown up with. This thing doesn't make sense to me. This black and white and right and wrong and, you know, kafir and mushrik and Hindu and Sunni and Shia, these things just don't make sense. They feel alien to my soul. They are just not right. That's the time when I decided to momentarily shut my books and say, bid farewell to the Islamic studies. And I said, I need to get myself back before I can re-embark upon these studies. At that point, I was lecturing then. When I went to Dar es Salaam, I saw Hindus coming to the procession of Imam Hussein. 
venerating Imam Hussein and Hazrat Abbas. So I took the liberty of talking with them and I said, well, what do you see in this man? He said, oh no, he is not a Muslim. He is a man of God. He reminds us of all the virtues that our religion gives us. He is no less than one of our prominent figures. In England, I was talking with a group of priests and I narrated the story of Imam Hussein with Hazrat Ali Asghar and his sentiments at that point and the way he turned to God and their eyes flooded with tears. It was at this point I realized that yes, this is the true religion. This is the essence of all religions. There is no religion beyond this. And I've went astray in this black and white religion of Islam. The real religion of Islam is what this Hussein is giving. There is nothing else other than this. So Imam Hussein, at the first stage of my life, kept me in the folds of religion through deep emotional attachment. At the second stage of my life, kept me in the religion through this beautiful understanding of the essence of religion that goes beyond distinction. You see, after, before re-encountering Imam Hussein for the second time, God in my mind had become a very formalistic God, a master who ordains. And I would think to myself, but I have found nothing but love in Imam Hussein. And that's how I would imagine my God to be, a very loving God, a very colorless God and colorful at the same time. A God who is most splendid, who reflects the depths of my yearning in his being, my good yearning in his being. And this God of Islam just does not make sense. So re-encountering Imam Hussein and getting that answer and going back into religion and religious studies, this time round with the proper perspective that these books are not carrying Islam. Islam is in the essence portrayed by Hussein and the family of Hussein. This is just for the bodies, this Islam that I'm studying. Going onwards, Imam Hussein was the one through whom life was led constantly, constantly, then of course you encounter God and you form a very intimate bond with God because you have learned the language of love, the language of acceptance, the language of embracing the other without seeing them as different from you. You see through Imam Hussein his forgiveness, the state of calm in his soul, the state of reliance upon Allah, preferring the decree of God above his own understanding of right and wrong or good and bad. So you begin to encounter that God and when you find that God, he is so overwhelmingly splendid that you arrive into a different universe altogether. That happens for a few years. Then as the journey continued, then came intellectual challenges. You see, once you establish that God is most splendid, most beautiful, then you turn to the word of God and you want to understand God from his own words. When you turn to the Quran, you read it once, you read it twice, you read it three times, after reading it 20, 30, 40 times, finally the penny drops and you say, Ooh, how can God say this? How can God be so bitter? How can God be so angry? How can he be so vengeful? I mean, even one verse that God says, you're my enemy, get out, descend from here. It's shocking to say, well, yes, these are the emotional states that I have. How can God have such emotional states? How can God put anybody in hell? 
Now, I know these things might sound very, very strange, and I don't want to confuse anybody, which I already might have done. But when you read the Quran, it's a shocking experience after you begin to reason. You begin to look carefully in the Quran. That was the most difficult part that I have encountered in the entirety of my life. <laughs> Being cut by a thousand swords is easier than that challenge. Because what you hold so sacred, so sacred, so unblemished, so untarnished, when that does not appear to be the case. Now I knew all along that there is something wrong in my thinking and not in what the Quran is saying. But you know, the mind, when it starts thinking, it needs to have answers. It needs a reconciliation. Now in the interim, that took 18 years, 18 years of sheer torture and toil and suffering, inner suffering. You know, it didn't make any difference to me if the people praised me or swore at me or cursed at me. These things never made any difference because you're involved in something so terribly disturbing that other things don't make sense. So you know God is beautiful. He is splendid. He is the peak of all beauty imaginable and beyond. God is God. How can God punish anyone? There is punishment, no doubt. But how can God punish anyone? Allah is Allah. You take Iblis and multiply him billion times over. That magnitude of Iblis does not amount to anything in front of God that God be his personal enemy. God is beyond enemies. God is beyond the pettiness of Islam and non-Muslims. Think about it carefully. Look at these heavens that God has created. Look at it. This is all that we can see. Do you think a God that mighty, that splendid, that glorious will have an enemy known by the name of Iblis? And what God is God who cannot forgive Iblis anyway? Can you see the problems here that were in my mind? And in the Quran you see, well, Iblis is not getting forgiven. He's going in hell forever and ever. I said, come on, that just does not add up. Now, whilst on this journey, which was the most difficult journey ever, it's easier to be cut into pieces than to undergo that journey. In this journey, the lifeline was Hussein. Do you know why? Because every time the mind would come back and say, but what God was Hussein worshipping? That he has radiance upon his face, serenity within his being, smile upon his lips as he is meeting with God. He lost everything. How did Hussein reconcile? What God has Hussein worshipped? Who is the God of Muhammad? Who is the God of Ali? Who explains so beautifully that he is with everything, yet he touches nothing. He is other than everything, yet there is no distance between him and anything. Which God did Muhammad Rasulullah worship? Who stood at nights lamenting praying to God and thanking God. Surely God is God, as is yearned from within my soul. Muhammad Rasulullah upheld the Quran as his code of conduct, and as an inspiration and a revelation from God. Ali Salamullah said, the difference between the speech of God, which is the Quran, and the speech of anybody else, is like the difference between the Creator and the created. How did they reconcile? So you know now that there is a reconciliation. You are waiting for that reconciliation to come into your mind. But those turbulent 18 years, the only thing that held me together and left me upon the faith was Hussein ibn Ali. 
so emotional involvement with him, then a spiritual involvement with him, and then an intellectual involvement with him throughout this life, whatever my blessed grandmother told me was true. Now I'm going to explain one or two more things, and I don't want to go too much into it. So my mother was an Ismaili for most part of her life, and then she said to me on uh, one, of, one of the occasions when she was very, very unwell and we were about to lose her, she said, I want to embrace the faith you practice. So write it down that I'm embracing your faith. In any case, I don't take too much about it, but when my, grand, when my great aunt told me to go and study religious studies, my mother was opposed to it. I mean, she didn't understand what is this study that you want to go to and leave us and go to some place in Middle East known as Iran or whatever. So she said, no. One of the days she actually called me. She said, I had a dream last night. She said, people that you belong to, Hussein, Akbar, Abbas, I don't know these names. They were with me and they said, give us your son. I'm not trying to praise myself here, but I'm just saying. Although I've already done it, haven't I? And this is just one percent. Just, just a glimpse of what I really am. Yeah. No. <laughs> Salawat, that's not true at all. Salawat. So she said, now I give you my consent, you can go. So that's one of my mothers. The other one, my great aunt, it was her wish that she should die on the day of Ashura and in my arms. So it was late hours or early hours of the morning and I was studying at Mother Sayyid al Khui and it was the, as I said, before the dawn on the day of Ashura. So I'd gone to the mosque to give a, a talk and I was still a, a, a very sort of a fresh student and I saw that, yeah, she's fine. I went to the mosque and uh, somebody came running and they said, well, the mosque is not at a distance from where we used, to, we used to live. And they said, your great aunt uh, wants you. So obviously I was hoping that if she's going to die, that she dies now. As much as it hurt me, as much as it hurt me, I was hoping that that's her wish. So I went there and made this, be a tribute to her and, and, and both the mothers of mine and all of our mothers. So I went there and the scene is this, that she told everybody around them, she said, leave me, call Arif. That's before I got there. And she looked at the door and she smiled. It, it wasn't me she was looking at. I hadn't come in at that, that point. And she smiled and she said, come. Then she looked towards the ceiling and she smiled. And she said, come. And by that time I arrived, I sat down and she lowered her head into my lap and she died. And that was the blessed way in which she went and she was a lover of Imam Hussein. And she is the one who instilled that love in my soul from that time. And that has never ever left. I will say this much that today people talk about Azadari and so on and so forth, it is very important. The story of Hussein needs to be repeated again and again and again. The hearts need to fall in love with this man. The hearts need to break in his love. The eyes need to tear. We need to lose ourselves in Hussein and Abbas and Akbar. By Allah, you will not find God through prayers and through Hajj and through fast and through recitation of the Quran if we don't have that deep-seated, very intimate connection of love with somebody who has dissolved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how much we talk about wahdaniyyah, wahdaniyyah does not mean this sort of bookish wahdaniya. Wahdaniya means giving our hearts away to the one. As namaz is a means to reach the wahid 
I don't mean Wahid Amin, I mean Allah. The heart has a means to reach the one. Namaz takes us to the God of the mind in the initial stages where we say he is one God. The love, intense love of Hussein takes us to the one of the heart where the heart gives itself away fully to God. And that is Wahdaniya in essence. So please keep on remembering Imam Hussein, participate in Muharram lectures, do not hesitate to narrate the story of Hussein, lament for Hussein like children cry for him.